If you grew up with books showing saber-toothed tigers, this creature will make you stop and rethink everything you thought you knew about prehistoric predators. Meet Thylacosmelis. It isn't a tiger, nor is it a cat, and the truth about how it fed might make you uncomfortable. What we're about to uncover in the next few minutes will show just how wildly different evolution can be when it's cut off from the rest of the world. This video will guide you through five crucial insights, each one stranger and more revealing than the last. Imagine standing in front of a skull with curved blade-like fangs stretching far beyond the lower jaw. At a glance, you would probably think it belonged to a saber-toothed cat, maybe even an ancestor of Smilodon. But then you're told that this predator wasn't a cat at all, and in fact its closest living kin are kangaroos and opossums. That kind of moment captures exactly why Thylacosmylus has fascinated paleontologists ever since its discovery in Argentina during the 1920s. The first fossils pulled from the Ituzaingo formation in northern Argentina by the Marshall Field Paleontological Expeditions looked so convincingly feline that early interpretations leaned heavily on comparisons with placental saber tooths. The skulls carried the same exaggerated upper canines, the same deep snout, and the same general body proportions you'd expect from a cat built for ambush. Yet, as more pieces were studied through the 1930s, it became clear that appearances were deeply misleading. The formal description in 1933 by Elmer S. Riggs helped cement that realization. He placed the animal in its own subfamily, Thylacosmelini, under the wider umbrella of Borhiainidae, a branch of Sporacidonts. These were carnivorous metatherians, members of the line that also produced today's marsupials. This classification was jarring because Thylacosmelis looked so uncannily like a saber-toothed cat, and yet it was separated from them by the same evolutionary gulf that divides a wallaby from a wolf. The teeth were long and sharp, yes, but the underpinnings of its skeleton show different anatomical traditions. Where placental cats developed one route to muscular support and cranial strength, Thylacosmylis had followed a very different blueprint. This contradiction, so cat-like in form, yet so unrelated in lineage, was the spark that made researchers question just how often evolution settles on the same solution twice. That brought forward the broader context of metatheria. These were not minor offshoots, they represented a whole alternate universe of mammals. In South America, sporacidonts became the dominant carnivores, filling roles otherwise taken by dogs and cats elsewhere. One of the most telling comparisons comes not from Argentina, but from Australia. There, another metatherian carnivore known as Thylacolio, often called the marsupial lion, evolved its own set of cutting teeth. Though shaped differently, it too carved out a top predator's niche. Neither Thylacosmylus nor Thylacolio were related to cats, but both converged on predatory adaptations that mirrored what placental carnivores had already invented halfway around the world. This is the essence of convergent evolution, different bodies arriving at the same performance. What allowed such experiments to unfold was isolation. For most of the Miocene, South America was cut off from other continents. With no true cats, no wolves, and no bears, crossing over groups like the Sporacidonts were free to expand into roles that elsewhere were tightly guarded by placental hunters. That evolutionary environment was less crowded, but it encouraged highly specialized experiments. Taxonomy, in this sense, becomes more than naming it decides how we interpret what life was like. If you mistake Thylacosmylus for a feline predator, you misread the entire predator-prey dynamic of Miocene South America. Recognizing it as a metatherian places it in the correct web of interactions and highlights how ecosystems without placental carnivores still generated their own apex hunters. So Thylacosmylus was not a cheap imitation of a cat. It was its own dramatic attempt at the saber-toothed lifestyle crafted by the unique circumstances of South America's isolation. But if its family tree upended expectations, the fine details of its anatomy raised even stranger puzzles. A predator with teeth like blades, yet jaws weaker than a house cat's bite. That description fits Thylacosmylus, and it tells you immediately that this animal never behaved like the saber-toothed killers you might be picturing. Its most striking feature was a pair of canines that never stopped growing. Unlike the closed-rooted teeth 
of most predators, these sabers extended continuously upward, even arching beyond the line of the eyes. Their cross section was triangular with strong ridges that made them resistant to bending and snapping. The bones of the skull had to grow around these immense roots, which stretched over the brain case in a way not seen in any other carnivorous mammal. The sheer amount of skull real estate dedicated to these teeth suggests they were the centerpiece of its anatomy. With weapons that large, you would expect a devastating bite. But when researchers reconstructed the forces at play in its jaws, Thylacosmylus came up short. The attachment sites for jaw muscles were surprisingly small and studies showed the bite force fell below that of a domestic cat. Compare that to the powerful jaws of lions or extinct Smilodon, which could bite deep into muscle and bone. And the contradiction is obvious. Everything about Thylacosmylus looked like a super predator until you realized it lacked the mechanical power to use its teeth in the same way. Even more puzzling, it had virtually no upper incisors, the teeth most carnivores use to strip flesh off bone. In some fossils, there are peg-like lower teeth, but nothing close to the functional set you'd expect. The wear patterns on its post-saber teeth strengthen the paradox. In many specimens, the grinding surfaces became blunted, but not in the slicing pattern you see in cats that shear through meat. Instead, the enamel showed low complexity and low anisotropy, a texture similar to what you find in cheetahs that avoid bones and consume softer tissue. It seems Thylacosmylus was deliberately staying away from chewing sinew or cartilage. This was no bone crusher and nothing in its anatomy suggests it processed carcasses the way hyenas or jaguars might. So if the jaws did so little, where did the killing power come from? The answer seems to lie in the neck and shoulders. Vertebrae in its cervical series were thick and reinforced, while the humerus and other limb bones show expanded muscle attachments. This indicates that its forequarters and neck could absorb strong forces. Instead of relying on the closing of the jaws, Thylacosmelus likely drove its sabers with downward thrusts powered by the entire neck. In essence, the head was more like a stabbing tool attached to a lever of muscles running along the spine. Its teeth weren't simply oversized knives, they were tool tools wielded by the rest of the body. The missing incisors changed how food was taken in as well. Without the ability to nip or scrape, it couldn't feed like other saber tooths. Combined with a relatively small infraorbital foramen, which reduced precision control of the muzzle. It's clear this predator lacked the fine motor adjustments to position its fangs with exact accuracy. In the end, the skull looked like a killing weapon, but it wasn't structured for the classic saber tooth style of grappling and cutting. Even compared to specialized pred predators, Thylacosminilus stood out as an anatomical oddity. And the strangeness of those features only starts to make sense when you set them against the backdrop of the South American environments it lived in. On a continent without true cats, Thylacosmelus managed to rise as a top predator, though the way it held that position looked nothing like what you might expect from a saber-toothed carnivore. South America during the Miocene and Pliocene was a world apart, cut off for millions of years from the northern continents. This isolation produced ecosystems where familiar carnivores such as lions, wolves or even hyenas never appeared. Instead, entire niches were filled by sporacidonts, a diverse group of carnivorous metatherians. Thylacosmylus stood at the peak of this order, living in an environment that was shifting from forests toward open grasslands with climate trends pushing temperatures lower and landscapes toward greater aridity. That backdrop was anything but simple. Coexisting with Thylacosmylus were terror birds or forest racids, massive flightless predators that could sprint across plains at high speeds and crush prey with powerful hooked beaks. These birds were not just oddities, they were real competitors, and their dominance in open ground meant that any other predator had to carve a different approach. At the same time, herbivorous notungulates grazed the grasslands in large numbers, serving as the primary prey base. They ranged in size from small deer-like forms to larger stockier animals, and in many ecosystems, they represented the energy source that predators circled around. Climate change added another layer of pressure, turning patchy woodlands into savanna-like zones where stealth and ambush strategies had to replace drawn-out chases. 
Evidence from isotope analyses helps ground these ideas. Studies of tooth enamel show that thylacosmartulus fed largely on grazers tied to C4 plants, the very grasses that came to dominate in the increasingly open landscapes of the late Miocene. That connection places it firmly in the role of a hunter or consumer in the plains, not an animal confined to dense cover. While it might look at first like it mirrored placental saber tooth such as Smilodon, the truth is more complex. Smilodon specialized in overpowering large herd animals on the North American plains, relying on robust bodies, specialized killing bites and different skull mechanics. Thylacosmylus, despite its resemblance, worked within the constraints and opportunities of a metatherian design taking a role no other South American carnivore could copy. In terms of body size, Thylacosmylus was not enormous, but still impressive. Weighing between 80 and 120 kilograms, it reached about the size of a jaguar, which in modern ecosystems serves as a top ambush predator. Its limbs and joints reveal a build tuned for grappling rather than pursuit. The shoulders were especially strong, the back stiff, and the claws non-retractile, all of which support the picture of an animal that launched sudden attacks from cover using forceful frontal engagement to subdue prey. There was little in its skeleton to suggest that it could chase victims over long distances. This leaves us with a predator that was powerful in short bursts, but dependent on strategy and positioning. Surrounded by terror birds and facing prey adapted to open habitats, Thylacosmylus fit into a specialized bracket, neither redundant nor directly copying the niches of placental saber tooths abroad. It existed because South America lacked cats, dogs and bears, and so it held the apex role through anatomy and behavior unique to that continent's evolutionary experiment. Once understood in this light, its unusual features no longer appear as flaws, but as answers crafted by isolation. Yet even so, the lingering question has always been with such unconventional tools, how exactly did it hunt or feed? Was this beast a hunter, a scavenger, or something even stranger? Thylacosmylus has invited speculation for decades because its body shouted apex predator, while its actual mechanics whispered something else. The giant sabers make you expect a killing machine, but as soon as you account for its weak bite force and strange absence of incisors, the picture blurs. That tension has led to several competing reconstructions, each trying to explain how such a bizarre animal could have survived at the top of South America's food chain. The most conventional answer is the hunting hypothesis, which imagines Thylacosmylus using its immense canines in a way similar to saber-toothed cats. In this scenario, it would leap onto prey, hold it down with four limbs, then drive its teeth into the flesh. The problem is that nothing in its skull supports this classic cat-like strategy. A limited bite force means it couldn't deliver a crushing throat puncture and the lack of incisors meant it struggled to process muscle once the victim was killed. When you line those facts up, the idea of it being an efficient cat-like hunter falls apart. That leaves scavenging as an alternative. Could Thylacosmylus have simply fed from carcasses left behind by other predators or natural deaths. Here again, its anatomy raises red flags. Scavengers succeed when they can crush bone and extract every last calorie. Hyenas, for example, have jaws built for cracking through skeletons to reach marrow. Thylacosmylus had nothing of the sort. Its sabers were long and fragile, not designed for grinding. The dentition behind them shows little evidence of shearing flesh from bone. With no incisors and no crushing power, it seems unfit for a carrion eating lifestyle too. The strangest, but also the most convincing proposal is what's known as the organ specialist theory. According to this view, Thylacosmylus wasn't trying to kill robust prey by force or strip bones clean afterward. Instead, it used its canines as a kind of biological can opener. Once a carcass was weak, immobile or already dead, the sabers would puncture the hide to grant access to internal organs. These are soft, highly nutritious tissues that don't require incisors or heavy jaw power to consume. Suddenly the missing pieces line up, weak jaws don't matter if you're not chewing and lost. Incisors are irrelevant if the goal is to scoop out organs with the tongue. Wear patterns on the fossil teeth support this gruesome interpretation. Instead of the heavy striations you'd expect from slicing muscle or scraping bone, the microware is simple and smooth. It looks like the record left by animals that avoid hard material in favor of soft food. Biomechanical studies also back up the concept. 
The skull wasn't shaped to resist the crushing stresses of a typical bite, but it did handle forces from powerful neck movements. That fits the idea of the animal driving its head downward, stabbing into a carcass with muscles anchored at the base of the skull and shoulders. Even the triangular claw-like profile of the canines suggests a pulling action rather than a stabbing cut. Compared with Smilodon, which pinned and suffocated prey before sinking its sabers into vulnerable spots. Thylacosmolus seems almost alien. Its feeding system wasn't just odd, it was virtually unique among mammals. And if this picture is accurate, then it means Thylacosmolus earned its place in history, not as a generic hunter, but as a specialized consumer of organs. Whether that made it more scavenger than killer or something in between its bizarre niche was not sustainable forever. Evolution can invent strange tools, but the fate of Thylacosmolus would depend on far bigger changes sweeping across the continent. Thylacosmolus survived in South America for millions of years, but its end came during the Pliocene between 3.6 and 2.58 million years ago. The rise of the Isthmus of Panama allowed placental predators like Smilodon wolves and bears to flood southward, introducing competition it had never faced. Unlike them, it had evolved within an isolated ecosystem committed to a highly specialized feeding strategy. That specialization became a weakness. The story of Thylacosmolus shows how evolution can create remarkable predators, but also how rapidly they can vanish once continents connect and more versatile hunters arrive to take their place.